Well, thank you everyone for joining us today, and I hope you're all doing well. Uh, my name is Shushan Bhazracharya. I am the Urban Waters Ambassador hosted at the Mystic River Watershed. And today we're gonna to be talking about trash in general, understanding why trash is a problem, what are the, some of the projects that Myra is involved in in tackling this problem, and how can we, how can you be involved in um, this um, problem? So before jumping into the topic, I would like to give you all some background about Myra. So we are a environmental nonprofit based in Arlington, Mass, and we work with 21 uh, municipalities around our watershed. And our mission is to protect and restore the Mystic River, its tributaries, and a watershed lands for the benefit of present and future generation to celebrate value, importance, and great beauty of these natural resources. We work on numerous projects such as water quality, greenways, climate resilience, education, restoration, and stewardship. So trash is a subject matter and a pollutant that intersects with a lot of these projects that we are working on, including education, restoration, stewardship, and even greenways. We don't wanna see trash in our biking paths or the parks that we go to. So this is um, a drawing from that is about 150 years old from the lower part of our watershed. And this is how, how it looks right now. What I wanna draw from this picture is uh, things change very rapidly and a lot of infrastructure has uh, been built over the time. We being a very urban watershed, three major pollutants that we deal with every day is, first is bacteria. As I mentioned earlier, Boston is one of the oldest cities in the world and we have uh, the problem of aging infrastructure. The sewage system that was built uh, in the past gets overwhelmed when there is an extreme rainfall. And sometimes sewage gets in, mixed up with the river and that's where the bacteria comes from. Secondly, phosphorus. When our city was built, we replaced the soil lands with impervious lands such as parking lots, streets, and sidewalks. And what tends to happen in, a, in an event of rain is water from parking lots, streets, and sidewalks get into a, the storm drains, collecting everything along its path, including excess phosphorus into our rivers. Third, one that captures many people's attention is trash. We being a very urban watershed, trash is one of the problems that we deal with every day. And something interesting about this problem is um, whatever you see as trash is something that we use every day in our daily lives. So it is a problem that is a behavioral problem, that is a systemic problem and yeah, I mean, now I would like to call upon Andy to uh, elaborate on the trash problem and impacts of trash in general. Thank you, Sushant. Um, yeah, so I wanted to just step back um, broadly and ask why are we as a watershed organization concerned about this? Like what, why, why, why did we choose this as a project? Um, one, one issue is uh, that, um, it's an aesthetic issue um, in the sense that uh, we don't want to see um, trash floating in our urban rivers um, for a variety of reasons. Just almost purely aesthetically, it's a problem because it implies that our water um, bodies are not being taken care of. It um, limits people's enjoyment of those water bodies. So there, that's absolutely one of the our ways into this project. But another is that um, trash and especially plastic um, trash in waterways is, we'd argue a huge, uh, a, and many people argue a huge and ongoing and growing environmental problem. And um, the two big um, themes um, that we, that I just want to focus on briefly here are these that most trash and especially as we'll see plastic in the ocean comes from rivers. So how does the, how does plastic in the, in the ocean get there? Most of it comes from rivers, step one. Step two, most trash in rivers comes off the land. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about both of these, um, but if you can show me the next uh, slide. 
So plastic in the oceans, as many people know, and especially many young people are very um, aware of this and mobilized by this, plastic in the ocean is a, is a um, um, uh, uh, large and growing, as we'll see, environmental problem. One aspect of it is macro uh, uh, trash, right? Large scale plastic debris, famously in the upper left corner, um, albatrosses feed their young. Um, uh, uh, sometimes uh, a diet of plastic, pieces of plastic that are floating that they can't, for whatever reason, distinguish from um, uh, food items. Um, and, um, and it's partly the odor that, that's associated with them. In any case, they, um, they uh, feed their chicks and their chicks end up starving and having a digestive system as this picture depicts of um, filled with plastic. You know, turtles get ensnared in fishing nets. There's large scale plastic debris. But that's one scale of the problem. But I think that if you show the next slide, Sushant, a probably bigger uh, problem is what happens to the large pieces of plastic when they um, degrade and they degrade into so-called microplastics. Microplastics, very small particles of plastic um, have the, have the um, among their uh, negative effects is that they attract other organic pollutants. So um, other complex organic um, chemicals that are in the ocean, when they meet a piece of plastic, adhere to it and um, stay attached. And that those small bits of debris enter the food web through and and can create large scale problems through this you know this well known mechanism of bioaccumulation you know so um, swordfish famously to pick another example um, have high levels of mercury in their um, tissue not because mercury is famously deposited. Um, uh, from the atmosphere, it comes from the burning of coal, it gets deposited in the ocean. It's very dilute at very dilute concentrations. But um, small animals that eat, uh, that uh, ingest mercury can't get rid of it. The larger fish that eats the smaller fish can't get rid of it from their tissue. And by the time you get to swordfish, these top level predators that we eat, you can get fish that have essentially funneled all that very dispersed mercury into their tissue. When people worry about, um, about plastic, they worry about complex, um, uh, th so that's one mechanism, the, the, the uh, very complex um, or complex uh, long-lived um, toxins and um, chemicals that are hormone disruptors and have, um, very negative effects on biological systems, some of which we don't know yet, like bisphenol A is famously a component of plastic that's been highly regulated recently because of its um, hormone mimicking effects. But a whole new class, you know, newly, um, newly uh, classes of chemicals that are the object of new focus, like these PFAS chemicals, these fluorine, fluoride, fluorine containing chemicals that are very long lived, have negative interactions with biological systems, um, are only gonna get worse as plastic pollution increases. So if you can send it, next slide. And just this, this graph always stuns me um, when I show it. This is a graph of um, the, of plastic waste generation since 1950, essentially since 1950. Um, and one takeaway from this is that 99, 90, more than 95% of plastic waste has been generated since I was born. Um, but I'm an old person. What really stuns me is that half of all plastic waste generation in the history of the world has happened since my kids who are 22 were born. And if you look at this, um, this curve, it's continuing to accelerate. This is a problem that we're at the beginning, not the end of a large scale um, environmental problem. 
And if I could see the next slide, this is a related slide from a paper called um, in science called the, the production and fate of all plastic ever made. Um, and it shows, it tries to account for what has happened to all the plastic production. Where is that plastic now? And it turns out that of the 83 uh, million uh, metric tons, uh, I believe that's the unit there, um, uh, of plastic that have been produced. Some is still in use in our you know, tables and chairs and telephones. The vast majority has been discarded or incinerated. And if you think uh, recycling is a problem, this is a very daunting um, graphic because you can see that uh, some small percentage has been recycled, but of the material that has been recycled, most has ended up again in the waste stream. And that's true of plastic. It can be recycled once or twice, but then it, it stops being useful and ends up in the waste stream. So this is an ongoing growing environmental problem and um, related to, and a lot of this plastic is getting to aquatic environments. So next slide. Yeah, and I'll pass it back to Sushant. Thank you, thank you, Andy, for a very brief um, about plastic. So, Trash Free Mystic Initiative is um, so in order to like, as we know, like trash is a big problem in our watershed, and in order to tackle this problem, Myra initiated Trash Free Mystic Initiative in um, 2020, and uh, it's a it's an initiative by it's an initiative to tackle short term and long term impacts of trash through education, stewardship, and data collection and collaboration. I would say. So this is a map of stormwater pipes in Malden, which um, is underneath our roads. The main purpose of these pipes is to drain excess water when it rains to the Malden River. But what happened, what is happening is it's not only draining the water, but is also draining all the trash that are in sidewalks, in parking lots, and that are in our streets. So hence, I also want to like go, I mean, when, go back to the what Andy said about like trash that you see in the river is not coming from people throwing trash in the river, but it's coming through the stormwater pipes. And that's what is happening here as well. So, it, so this is a picture of a Malden River trash trap, a trash boom, which was installed by the Friends of the Malden River and our super volunteer, Karen Buck, um, over the years. The trash boom was there for about one and a half year and it really did a good job in trapping all the trash that was coming from um, the stormwater pipes up in Malden. And um, even though I mean the trash trap was working very good, it, it needed frequent maintenance and trash could easily sometimes escape in an event of a big storm or a big wind. So on November 18, uh, November 18, 2021, as part of National American Wetland Conservation Act grant, Mystic River Watershed Association in coordination with Friends of the Malden River, City of Malden and River's Edge installed a floating trash trap into the Malden River. Some of the interesting facts about this floating trash trap is it can hold about 120 15 gallon trash bags at a time. The size of the trash trap is eight feet wide um, 16 feet long and four feet tall. And it requires less cleanup over the year. So if you installed after our installation, it only needs to be cleaned 10 times in a year. If you are interested to take a look at this trash trap, this is located in the Malden River in between La Marquez and Co. La Marquez and Sons Bakery and Cambridge Health Alliance. So over the years, uh, Myra has collaborated with numerous um, education institutes, nonprofits, private organizations all over our watershed to organize stewardship programs. And so far, we've engaged more than 700 people, 700 volunteers, and collected about 479 bags of trash, all through collaborative efforts. So these stewardship programs are a participatory engagement or a team building programs, which gives opportunity for people to learn, understand, and understand the problem about trash from the ground experience. One of the things we do after our cleanup is we do reflection on what, what was the thing that we learned from our cleanups. What we tend to do is we gather around 
the trash bags that we collected and we asked questions like what was the most common thing that was that you picked up what did you learn from this activity and a lot of times uh, volunteers have really appreciated that when they are engaged they go back home with the message saying that okay i should be really cautious about the using single use plastic bottles because that's one of the things that's really common in our cleanups and if you are interested to be engaged with us there are a lot of numerous opportunities throughout the year um, um, if you read if you are really concerned about litter problem in your neighborhood we have a program called nominate a park program where um, you can fill up a google form and um, you can also sign up to like do a self-guided tour and also like we and then if you once you signed up we can help you by supplying necessary tools and materials to do a trash cleanup um yeah now i would like to call Andy andy to give some other backgrounds on other projects that we're working on Great, thank you. So, yeah, so um, one of our objectives um, is to um, collect data on good high quality data or, or um, quantitative data on, on where the collect trash problems may be located in our watershed. Um, and one mechanism we have for doing this is the so-called visual trash assessment, which is a, an EPA protocol for um, pretty simple but systematized so that we you can compare different areas um, where volunteers go out and uh, survey city streets. Again, with that with that sort of causal model in mind that what trash that's getting to waterways is being swept by rainstorms down storm drains and straight unfiltered to the nearest river or lake or stream. Um, volunteers go out and survey the um, uh, pre predetermined um, stretches of road and report back their data. And then we can, you know, in the upper left hand corner, show uh, where, how, and they grade them on a scale of A to D um, with a, you know, kind of rubric. And you can show where the relatively cleaner streets are and where the um, relatively uh, more trash ridden streets are. And we've done this twice now um, and we plan more. Um, but you can do something more interesting, which is take that data and then overlay land use data and ask, do the, do the red streets that are getting low grades have something in common? And do the green streets have something in common from the point of view of land use? And in particular, for instance, do commercial areas um, differ significantly from residential areas? And the result of that that overlay analysis is in the bottom um, on in the bottom um, table now replicated twice with the same results, which is. Um, which shows that you know industrial and commercial land use types have systematically lower grades than um, that top category that's getting an A minus high density residential. In in our in these urbanized areas in Somerville and Malden and Medford, all you know essentially all standalone houses are in so-called high density residential. That's all there is in the city. Um, but that that's sort of referring to residential neighborhoods. And you can see they're systematically better. And why, so why, so that's interesting, but why is it useful? I, the way we hope to use this kind of data, and we're, we're, getting, we're getting another tranche of data to uh, help support these conclusions from different municipalities, is that is to um, advise um, municipalities on where, cost-effective investments in management might help. So, and in particular, where increased street sweeping, perhaps as a, as a systemic, as a municipal level solution to this problem might have a disproportionate effect. So we could say, based on this kind of data, that's again, gathered by volunteers, which is awesome. Um, um, we could say, okay, we realize resources are tight, but if you were to um, direct intensive street sweeping, don't, you don't have to go everywhere. You can keep your normal street sweeping schedules in residential neighborhoods, but 
really target these commercial neighborhoods and you may have a disproportionately large effect. So we're excited about this data collection. We worked with EPA on this and, and they're excited to see this data too. If I could have the next slide. And another uh, project that we have uh, just now getting up and running is a so-called adopt a street drain program where, where the city of Medford um, created this online platform where you can um, so-called adopt a, a, a storm grade and pledge to, you know, informally pledge to go out and make sure that it's not covered with leaves in the fall so that um, it causes localized flooding, that if you see trash about to go down, you go and clean it out. We don't see this as, I should say, and so we have a grant from, um, from DEP to from Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection to replicate this online platform in, in 13 municipalities in our watershed. And we really see this as an education tool rather than the answer to the pollution problem, right? We're not, we're not thinking that it's people's responsibility to keep trash from going down storm drains, but I think it's a really valuable, um, and the, the town engineers and other officials have thought it's valuable too, tool for, reminding people that the stormwater system is carrying pollution to waterways. And um, yeah, and so we're excited to be rolling that out and that'll be rolled out this summer. Have the next slide. Yeah, and that's, that, that's a brief overview of our um, programs. And we're excited to continue this work. Again, I, one very big motivation is creating a river that, um, because one of our goals is to engage people in environmental protection more broadly, right? So, and protecting the river in all its aspects. And one way to do that is to create a river that looks well taken care of. And, and one way of doing that is to have less trash very visible. It's a visible and important pollution problem. So yeah, I'll stop there. Awesome, thank you so much, Andy and Sushant for that awesome presentation. Um, I think we'll start with some Q&A now. Uh, first in the Q&A box, um, Karen mentioned a, um, a group that she works with, founded, um, that swims in the Upper Mystic and was talking about doing, uh, collaborating with us on cleanups and different things. And um, absolutely, we love to collaborate with local groups on cleanups and other initiatives, so we'll definitely reach out. Um, and if anyone else is involved with a group or um, perhaps the corporation that you work for is interested in volunteering, that's something that we definitely um, would love to work with you on. Uh, other questions popping up. First one um, from Sarah. So how do Myra staff and volunteers feel about the multifaceted work they're doing and have accomplished together? Um, especially since, as Andy illustrated, this work is tackling such a large scale problem. Um, I imagine it must be overwhelming sometimes. Uh, <laughs> that's a great answer. I guess we can each um, give our response to that. I'll start with Sushant. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about it. Maybe Andy, <laughs> do you want to go first and I'll, I'll sure, go to I mean, the second I, one? <laughs> um, you know, I, I really, it's a, it's a, you know, cliche by now, by now, but um, I find this is a perfect issue to illustrate that slogan of um, think globally and act locally. Part of what motivates me in um, my passion for keeping pollution out of the Mystic River is a larger commitment to um, environmental um, sustainability, you know, as we as we enter a century where natural systems are coming under all kinds of threats, um, uh, it's important to keep those global issues in mind, but then turn the energy and passion that we have for that into local action. And I think this this is a case where you know this issue of plastic in the ocean, you know, it's you know. It's the Mystic River is not producing most of the plastic in the ocean, but by making that conceptual connection to what the work we're doing in in cleanups and in data collection here, I think it helps. Um, it helps 
I, I find it energizing, first of all. And secondly, I think it helps build a community of people who care about these issues more broadly. Yeah, I'm ready now. So, um, so I, I thought about it for a while. Yeah, I mean, definitely it's the work that we're doing, like really um, motivating also. Um, we look at it as like, yes, it's a problem because um, it's a systemic problem. It's a behavioral problem. The, pr the trash that's out there is something that we use every day. And I feel like um, when we work on these projects, we really want to encourage people to be part of this problem and want to educate people as much as we can so that they can be, because this is not something that uh, someone can come up with the solution and it gets solved because it's part of our system. It's part of every everyday work that we do. And and I feel like people needs to be educated. And um, and as we go forward with in, engaging with different peoples out there and educating them about like why it's a problem, I feel like it's uh, it creates a ripple effect in where they uh, share with their peers, they share with their colleagues. And our goal is to um, educate people as much as we can so that they understand that, okay, this is a problem that needs to be addressed. Thank you both for those answers. I guess I'll share how I feel about it. Um, for me, working on large scale issues, it definitely can be overwhelming, um, but I feel always grounded working with volunteers. Uh, and I feel like working with volunteers is what motivates me every day. If you're taking time out of your day to work on these issues. Um, I just find it very inspiring and gives me hope in uh, making progress towards these problems. So even the time that you volunteer today to learn about um, what's happening in your local area. Um, and if you talk to one other person about it today, I think that that's kind of multiplying the impact. Um, so yeah, that's my answer. <laughs> Great question though, thank you. Uh, next, someone asks, on nominating parks, uh, the river along the Wellington T Station parking lot has a ton of trash um, that was brought in by homeless people. Is there a chance of organizing a cleanup of this area? Um, Sushant, do you want to answer that one? Yeah, definitely. Uh, what we do normally do after you've submitted a form um, through Nominate a Park is we tend to like check out the park and coordinate with the local um, agency, the uh, who owns the park and then we can definitely um, do a cleanup and if you want to be in charge and take want to take a lead then I would also help you to like um, supply with supplies and everything and yeah we definitely can do it. Cool thank you. Um, Karen asks uh, where and how does Myra weigh in on the proposed changes to the bottle bill attempts to reduce trash inputs? Um, Sushant I'll let you answer, answer this one too. Awesome. No, definitely. We uh, let me let me read the question real quick as well. So we definitely support bottle bill. Myra has been in touch with uh, organizations like Mask Work, who have been advocating on bottle bill, and um, and it, actually we were planning to launch a project for Earth Month in um, doing a microplastic survey in terms of um, by collaborating with Mask Work, and with bottle bill we. Be looking forward to like collaborate with um, our city agencies and advocate. We we definitely would um, at, would continue advocating on bottle bill. And I think as part of our Earth Month, we did um, shared some information. Daria, do you want to elaborate a little bit more on that? Sure. Yeah, I just put in the chat. This is Massperg's um, document on how you can advocate for the bottle bill. And for those who don't know what the bottle bill is, um, it's proposed legislation which would increase the um, deposit for recyclable bottles from five cents to 10 cents. Um, and I think it would expand the amount or the types of bottles that it applies for. Um, correct me if I'm wrong there. And I think that hopefully that's going to incentivize people to collect recyclable bottles and um, submit them to get that 10 cent deposit. So in that way, helping to reduce um, recyclable trash that ends up on the roads. Also to add up, we when we do our cleanups, because 90% of the time that we collect is plastic bottles. And we also tend to educate people about like, there's a bill that's out there that you should like support. And we, we tend to do that as well. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, next one from Yishen, it's, um, DC has developed water quality standards for solid waste and developed 
a TMDL uh, pollutant reduction loading budget for trash. Are there similar plans in our watershed or at Mass DEP? Um, wondering if this would incentivize the state to allocate steady funding to reduce trash pollution. Um, Andy, do you know anything about a, a pollutant reduction loading budget for trash? Um, yes, I mean, that's a, 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 that's a great question. Um, there, so this so-called TMDL regulatory pathway where um, if you can demonstrate um, that a waterway is affected disproportionately or beyond uh, in a way that violates water quality standards and can calculate how much uh, material is going in, you can um, uh, uh, sort of uh, release regulatory, um, you can um, uh, force regulatory changes. Um, there have been a couple of TMDL, uh, TMDLs for trash in the United States. One was in LA, I think, one in Baltimore or in DC. And we've actually had people from those municipalities um, present at previous trash webinars. Um, and in particular talked about um, the tools they use to reduce trash loads in those municipalities because they've been obliged to keep real kind of quantitative um, records of how much credit they can get for having reduced trash. And so we're, we're trying to learn lessons from them. Frankly, we have our hands full with a TMDL effort on phosphorus, which is a, a big um, multi-year science project that's culminated recently in a report from DEP and EPA on phosphorus pollution in the mystic. And we know that EPA and DEP also have their hands full there. So we're probably not gonna take advantage of that regulatory pathway to force change in the mystic um, it, because it's unlikely to be taken up anytime soon. But we, what we are doing is the similar kind of, um, we hope to kind of do an end run around that and sort of gather data that goes back to that street level data. Where is the trash problem concentrated and how can we advise municipalities on cost-effective ways to um, to uh, solve that problem. One interesting connection here is that um, as a phosphorus reduction method, street sweeping gets municipalities some credit um, with EPA for having reduced phosphorus, but street sweeping also uh, helps the trash problem. And so we have in mind those kinds of synergies and are um, in any way, are, are trying to gather data with the, the TMDL model is gather data, do a study, issue uh, uh, suggestions for reducing loads. We're trying to do that uh, in a more informal way. Thanks, Andy. Uh, also from the chat, Carol asks if this recording will be available to share. And yes, we will publish this recording on our YouTube channel. And I can send out that link to, to everyone who attended here. Um, next question. Uh, is from the Q&A box. Uh, trash blows off parking lots from shopping centers like the one across from the Gateway Center into Gateway Park in Everett. I pick up trash in Gateway Park every week and it's a constant effort. Is anyone thinking about how this trash might be intercepted before it hits the river, um, fences or, or plant barriers? This is a very interesting question. Actually, Andy and I were having this conversation just last week about like, um, yeah, we, we look into trash coming from water, but what about trash coming from getting blown from parking lots? And uh, I would say to, um, with inter to answer your question, um, for interceptors, we, uh, we um, so what we can do is we can um, use street sweeping. So street sweepings are the one of the methods of um, intercepting the trash before it held, held, um, gets into the river. So one of the things that we wanna get out from the VTA that we did is to identify which streets are more, have more trash than others. After identifying, we would like to give uh, cities the particular location on where there's a lot of amount of trash and then cities can increase the intensity of street sweeping in these areas. And I feel like that way they could um, decrease the amount of trash. One of the uh, other interesting thing we can also, Andy and I were just talking about it is, we would maybe in the future we would want to experiment with uh, 
a net or something to un, to study about um, trash coming out from the air in the future as well. Well, this is a really good question though, thank you. Thanks, Yushant. Next question is, with regards to the nomination form, can you explain what a self-guided cleanup in this location with Myra support entails? Who is being guided? Um, I'm happy to take this one actually. Um, so with a self-guided cleanup, we would help to arrange permissions with the landowner for you to be able to go clean up um, on that particular park or path um, or whatnot. And we would be happy to help um, provide you with supplies. So that's trash bags, gloves, trash pickers, if you'd like them. And then we can also arrange um, pickup of the trash bags after the cleanup. So that would be um, contacting the local DPW, Department of Public Works, or DCR if it's on the Department of Conservation and Recreation land. Um, so the reason why it's self-guided is because as, as staff, we have a very small staff and limited um, capacity to be everywhere at once. And so we're happy to figure out the logistics with you, but if you, whoever signs up the form are willing to be a leader for your group, um, we would provide all of the permissions and supplies and pickup, um, as well as safety information and instructions uh, and you would be the one to take your group to a particular location and, and pick up the trash that day, if that makes sense. Awesome, I think one more question from the chat. Um, talking about the area around the condon shell up to Medford Square, uh, John Han Bridge. So there are downed trees, trash filled bushes, um, bridge stones riddled along the banks and a very small channel up to West Medford, Boston Avenue. Um, is there a cleanup plan for this area beyond just trash pickup? Um, is dredging ever going to be an option to bring the Mystic River back to a more robust waterway uh, and then water chestnut mitigation progress in that particular area? Um, so I think first we can address the, the is there a cleanup plan in the Medford Condon Shell area um, beyond trash pickup. I think Tushan or Andy, if you want to take that one. I'm, I'm trying to understand, I'm looking to, because as far as I know, for Condon Shell, we did a cleanup last week, right? I mean, like um, for the Earth Month. And I'm, I'm just trying to see if I can see if um, we have anything clean, planned. As far, as far as my knowledge, I, I believe we don't have any cleanup plan, but um, if you have identified a lot of trash there, we would definitely would want to put it in our list and would want to do a cleanup there in the future for sure. Chris may have been asking about material that's not trash. So for instance, uh, brush and down trees um, and, um, uh, you know, if the park, if that land is DCR land, then DCR um, will do routine maintenance there. I always, I always, on just on that issue of brush and down trees, I always, there's always a slight trade-off uh, between um, aesthetics of a park and um, uh, kind of naturalized uh, uh, wildlife habitat. So a down tree is not, it's, it can be seen as unsightly or it can be seen as um, potentially um, uh, an important um, bit of microhabitat for, for um, introducing kind of variety and shelter and, and all sorts of things into the structure of the shore bank. So that, but that's in the side. Um, on the issue of dredging, um, you know, the, the Mystic River, um, is a very slow moving river with a very large dam at Amelia Earhart Dam at the end of it. Um, that with a, with a tide on the other side that goes up and down 12 feet, you know, every 12 hours. So it's, it's slow moving part and impounded partly because we don't want that tidal these days. It used to be that the tidal influence uh, extended way upstream, even as far as Lower Mystic Lake. But that we've we've stopped that, um, and we make it a very slow moving river. Sometimes not moving at all. Um, uh, one impact of that dam is the accumulation of silt. Um, 
And um, so if, if by robust, uh, restoring it to a room more, so dredging is sometimes used as a solution for removing that, um, that material that would have been slowly swept out to the ocean in the natural system um, and maybe um, impeding the hydrology or the ecology of the stream in some way. It's really expensive and especially in, in um, urbanized areas where it's been subject to 150 years of pollution where that material is contaminated, the deep sediment material. Um, it can it can be a like a um, infeasibly uh, expensive thing to do, um, but loc at certain local locations it might be it might be something that, um, but it would take a, a huge kind of federal investment uh, of money to to pull off in in any meaningful way. And water chestnut, I can also say that. You know, we're we're ramping up for a season of water chestnut control on the on the Mystic River, fueled by volunteers. Um, uh, so please help us, but also uh, accompanied by mechanical water chestnut harvest harvesting. We've been managing this invasive plant that used to be incredibly rampant on the Mystic River, um, and over the years, our work along with DCR has helped um, control that. Um, to a very large extent, um, COVID sent, set us back in our volunteer efforts in some ways. And so we're, we're playing a little bit of catch up, but we're planning to clear as much as we can of the Mystic River from you know, Lower Mystic Lake to, to the basin this summer. Yes, so keep an eye out on our calendar starting in July. July and August, um, we're gonna be having opportunities for volunteers to hop in canoes with us and uh, hand pull the water chestnut from the river. It's actually super fun. <laughs> it's very messy, but um, yeah, we do focus a lot on that um, particular section of the river near the conan shell um, and higher up. Awesome. Um, seeing no more questions. I do have one more question. Um, I was wondering if you could just talk about if you had two main takeaways that you are hoping people to walk away from this presentation with, uh, what would those be? I can, I can grab that. Um, so I, my two big takeaways are this local pollution problem is connected to a big global environmental problem. And the more we can make those connections, the better we can be, better off we'll all be, I think. Oh, <laughs> lost Andy. Um, if he comes back, he'll share his screen. But if not, yeah, no, I can I can go in the meantime. Um, sure, so yeah. The biggest uh, takeaway for me from this um, 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 webinar is, um, I would say, trash is a again, trash is a behavioral problem, and um, it's something we uh, so we can be a, make a difference in uh, solving this problem by making choices, and um, and I think. So that's first one. Second is, um, I would say, I'm just, I'm just thinking. Um, um, there's a lot of ways that you can, if you want to be involved in, if you are passionate about the trash problem, there are so many ways that you can be involved. And um, Myra is there with a lot of projects, and we are open to ideas and stuff. So we would. Um, love to work with you and yeah I mean so there are so yes there is a problem but there's there are possible solutions that we can come up with and that's the message that I want to like um, give you all I think that's a great message to to end on um, thank you all so much for joining us during your lunch period today um, I will send out a follow-up email to everyone who registered for this um, for this presentation with a link to the recording as well as a, a PDF of the slides if you're interested. Um, you know, spread the word <laughs> about the issue of trash um, and what can be done about it. And if you have any other questions that come up, um, our emails are linked on our website uh, and under our staff bios. And we love we would love to talk to you. <laughs> all right. Thanks so much Thank everybody. You all. Have a great day.